All right, so today I'm going to talk about something called VLBI geodetic backend. So for geodesy, there's been a lot of observing. We study the Earth by looking at quasars. So the original systems, the legacy systems we call them, are SX systems. The next generation or the generation that's being deployed right now are known as VIGO system, VLBI geodetic observing systems. They're a broadband system from 2.3 to 14 gigahertz is the range that's covered by the feed. And there's four tunable bands that you have to be able to adjust to, and they have to be a gigahertz wide for each of the bands. So this is what the geodetic backends are. So there's two people who were working on this before, Russ McWhorter, who actually presented at Casper in 2017. He gave all the details about the polyphase filter bank back end. Reggie Wilcox took his place because Russ went down to Wall Street. Reggie is now going to get his PhD at MIT. So I'm the one left as the last man standing. So the outline, we're going to talk about the signal chain. And when I'm talking about the signal chain, I'm talking about the electronics. I'm going to give you an overview of that. What systems do we have in operation? So there are, for NASA, we have presently four systems in operation. There's supposed to be six, two more antennas built. Um, so I'm just going to give you an overview of that. What were the FPGA requirements? I know this is about signal processing. So part of it's signal processing, but part of it's diagnostics. Because as you start to deploy systems, what does the FPGA have to do for remote observations and remote use? Operational requirements. This also adds a nuance to the FPGA requirements because what do you do when you deploy this system? What are the challenges we had? And give you some conclusions. So when I talk about the VLBI geodetic signal chain, what I'm referring to is a complete system from the front end, so it receives the optics from the antenna from the subreflector, so all the front end electronics, high band fiber, we come over coax for the low band, so a front end system, a back end system, we have a monitor and control system, and we have a cable delay system. All of these make up the signal chain. Looking in at the back end system, I said you can tune to four individual bands of a gigahertz. So what we have is an RF distributor that takes in the fiber and the coax. The reason we went with fiber and coax was because of RFI to be able to separate the two bands. So we chose two different methods of transporting it down from the antenna. The RF distributor is going to four up down converters, which actually allow you to tune and outputs either 512 megahertz for the older systems or 2.5 five gigahertz for the newer system, and it comes into a digital back end of which there are four. Right now it comes into a Mark VI. It can also go out directly over the 10 gig interface. The bandwidths are per digital back end, two, four, or eight gigabits a second of data are being generated right now in these back ends. And that's what I'm gonna concentrate on. So the systems in operation, we have two flavors that actually exist. One, our Roach-1 base systems, yes, they still are actually in existence. And NASA, they are for the six stations that we have. So there's 16 systems in operation plus four spheres. We have Roach-2 that have just begun to get deployed. So we have four systems in operation. It's OK. <laughs> just a little distracting. Plus one sphere. We're expecting NASA to upgrade all of their Roach 1s to Roach 2s. So once we found out that you were getting rid of the Roach 2s, that's kind of caused a cost issue for NASA. We require about 25 systems, five per station. So NASA is actually working with Brazil for Fortaleza to upgrade and also to get a system potentially in Tahiti. So the Roach 2 systems are kind of become the backbone. So this has caused a bit of an issue for us. Obviously, what you get is the differences in the ADC cards between the 1s and the 2s, 512, 2.5, Vertex 5, 6. The requirement we do have is that the Roach 2 based systems are operationally backwards compatible to the Roach 1s. Because we're merging the two in, migrating them through the system, we have to be able to get, it's not going to be a one complete upgrade. It's going to be based upon piecemeal upgrade of the systems. What were the requirements for the FPGA? It's a polyphase filter bank. The Roach ones, we have 32 channels, 32 megahertz, of which this is linear polarizations. There's 16 channels per pole. The Roach two, we have 128 channels of 32 megahertz, 64 channels per polarization. We use the VLBI data interchange format, VDIF plus VTP on top of it, which is gonna be 8,845 bytes coming out of the 10 gig interface. 
We have valid layer four or layer two format payloads. You can choose which one you want. You have to have a channel selection capability. Because of bandwidth constraints, getting data over the network is not that easy, so we do write it to disks. Shipping disks in that envelope is not so easy. If you're shipping two disk modules, it's costly. So we actually change the bandwidth. So we have eight channels that you can choose per polarizations for the Roach 1. For the Roach 2s, we have eight to be backwards compatible. You can do 16 or 32 channels. Of course, you can send out all channels too to maximize the bandwidth for that using the complete band. We have noise calibration generation. So the Roaches, we actually did, we created a GPIO board. So we send up between 10 and 100 hertz. It's programmable. It's usually about 80 hertz going up to the front end for calibration. We have a requirement that you have to be able to determine the system temperature, TSIS, for all channels, both on and off. And it has to be able to do phase calibration extraction. So besides just the polyphase filter bank, there are a bunch of other issues and features that are required for the FPGA. So here's a block diagram that Russ had presented two years ago showing the ZDoc interfaces, polyphase filter banks for both bands, the quantization, channel select capabilities, VDIF going into the 10 gig. Here is the base cal extraction and the TSIS extraction for both. We use multicast because what was happening is the PC field system wanted this information all the time, so they were querying the system. So we actually extract it on a one PPS bound and multicast it. So this way the PC field system can actually just grab all the data and this is actually used for remote debugging of the system. And it's actually very good to know if your system is configured properly. It's taking a step up, operational requirements. One of the things we've had to do is you have to boot into a known operation configuration. So the FPGA has to be loaded. A default configuration has to be loaded and it has to be the same every time. Channel selection has to be the same. The VDIF thread ID. So the VDIF thread ID, since there are four different systems generating data, each one of them has to have its unique thread ID. So in the correlation phase, we know which thread is associated with which frequency band, and we can actually determine the channel layout. Has to have UDP IP MAC VDIF header configuration. So we have to have valid ARP messages. Since we didn't program an ARP feature inside, we configure it manually along with the IP address of the source and the destination. So they are valid headers to go to a recorder or to actually go over a 10 gig NIC, 10 gig interface. The time, the PPS time has to be synced to an NTP server that we have running on the system. Most of the Vigo stations have NTP servers running inside. Um, data transmission on the 10G interface is on automatically after configuration. And we have the one pulse per second multicast configuration enabled. So each one has a unique multicast address and port where we send out TSIS information, phase cal, time, and if we have room, data samples, which are operational. There's a variable attenuator. So when the antenna gets onto its source, we actually calculate the power and we adjust the attenuation for a proper RMS value coming into the Roach and into the ADC. So this is done every time by the PC field system. So we have a variable attenuate of 0 to 31.5. We tried the LED displays. The LEDs, they didn't work so well. What happened was all four have to be time synchronized. There was no way for the operators to know. So we actually had to put in an LCD display, which was displaying the actual time, the VDIF time, because the VDIF time has an epic. And if a system reboots, you can have a different reference epic which will actually cause a problem at the correlator. They all have to be the same. So the only way they could do it is unless they pulled it is to have a display so an operator can go over and look at it. It must be operated by a site operator. Now, this is not a scientist or an engineer. These operators are there all the time. They're mechanical specialists whatsoever. They are there 24-7. They have to be able to operate the system. They have to be able to reboot the system and get it up and running as quickly as possible. That was a challenge, and it has to be completely controlled by a PC field system. So this is really a turnkey solution that's required for the end stations. If you look at the black diagrams, I showed you both the twos and the ones. This is our wiring diagram. This is what we sent to Digicom so they can actually build our systems for us. So if you look for the Roach 1, we had a GPIO board sitting on the Roach 1, which generated the diode control, which talked to the interfaces, which actually talked to the attenuators too. 
Single ADC, we have a synthesizer that was designed by Alan Rogers. It's programmable five to 10 megahertz per second, and it can put out two gigahertz or one gigahertz for the appropriate ADC cards, power supply. The Roach 2, you have the two ADC cards coming in, the GPIO, because this connector was removed, we had to add another GPIO board in it for the LCD control, for the diode control, and again, the synthesizer, the attenuators that are in line. This is what it looks like. So it's a little bit different than the Scarab 1U. It's a 2U with the display. You can see the attenuators are off the shelf, the synthesizer, the ADC cards, the GPIO card, and the Roach 2 system. So these are presently deployed. There are four for a single system for the Vigos environment. What are some of the challenges we've had? To get a turnkey solution is not easy. So going from DSP, writing the code, to getting it to fully operational has been a challenge. Obviously, when you change between Roach 1 and Roach 2, the USB support changed. There was none for the Roach 2. Why was this a problem for us? Because other countries have purchased the system. So for the Roach 1s, we had the complete system bootable from a USB disk, a little USB dongle that was sent with the system. They can connect it to the system, reboot, and their system would come up operational within a minute off a USB. Once the USB is removed, we've had to change that. We've had to give them the NFS mount, tell them how to configure an NFS server for this. A little more documentation, a little more challenging, but it was actually able to do it. USB was kind of a, for us, it was a big loss. A to C, ADC calibration. So it has to be the delay through the roaches should, or the delay through the back ends should be the same from boot to boot. What we found is that when we tried to calibrate it, the correlator was seeing slight differences in the time. For the correlator operator, from our correlator operator, and John Onoza, Mike Titus, that starts to make him pull his hair. Um, so I'd like to see if there's any way we can get that, so if there's something we could do with that to try to make it every time for configuration calibration, if you can get it the same. I know you probably thought about it. Another one, we do a lot of our work is funded by NASA, security requirements. Um, I don't even want to go into that. Having a supported OS, an embedded system can get a waiver. The minute they found out we're running a Linux derivative on there, the IT security guy's eyes lit up. It's obviously not supported. Um, it's been depreciated. This is a big problem for them. We have to always get waivers. Long-term support for existing systems. Obviously, obsolescence causes a problem. We have to support these systems. NASA's just not rolling out money for radio astronomy, and coming up with four systems for each is a bit of a problem. So these are challenges we faced after we got to the turnkey, but we're in a good state because we do run, and we're running every other week. We're going to be running 24-7 is the goal within about two to three years. Conclusion, to create the FPGA personality to meet the needs is half the battle. Um, a lot of people here do systems engineering and they know that. It's getting the polyphase filter bank, getting what the scientists need is great, but there's a lot of other things to get to an operational model. Um, diagnostic capabilities for remote operations is key. So one of the things that was brought up was about the DBBC. We work in collaboration for Vigos with the DBBC2, DBBC3. They don't have basic TSIS information. They don't have other information on the spectrum coming through. They love this feature. Yebes has one of our RDBEs. Excuse me, that's my mistake. Um, because they like some of the features that we have. It has to be backward compatible. Trying to get that involved from a design standpoint is very difficult. As you can tell, we had to change the GPIO boards. The whole signal chain had to change. All of this has to be taken into account before the design stage. As you can tell, the digital back end is only one part of the entire signal chain. So when we make a change, the ripple effect of that is quite large. And using Roach has been very good. We've been using it since iBob. We've used iBob, the Roach 1s, the Roach 2s. And that's part of the reason being here is where do we go from next? That's not a major pain for us because pitching, pitching this to uh, NASA is going to be a bit of a challenge for us. Thank you.
pigeons when I insisted in Adam's talk yesterday that Roach 2 should be designated as deprecated and everybody, uh, you know, there was a lot of agreement, I guess. And, and there's a few things going on, um, but I don't think Roach 2 is going away. It's not going away from me either. Um, the, the issue is that it has uh, an old tool chain that is very hard to support. And then the board itself has a number of obsolete parts. Parts, yes. They just continue parts. And it is five, six, seven years old. Actually, I think it came out in 2010 in prototype form. So right. it's nine years old. And kind of what you expect. Digicon made an announcement that they're going to stop fabricating them. Yeah, I already talked to Mo about this. And, uh, and maybe you need to stretch that to you. Yes. Uh, but of course, it's an open source board. So you can take the bill of materials and the artworks and go to some other contract manufacturer. And, and you know, good luck to you. I wouldn't want to do that. I don't want to do that either. No, I mean, we, especially for the entire signal chain, we get hit with this every time because NASA was supposed to build five of these systems in five years. They've stretched it out to one every three years. So we get hit with everything with obsolescence based on parts. So, I mean, I completely understand. It's not an issue, but I'm just trying to. I, I'm actually, for the benefit of the entire group here, I'm just kind of clarifying where that comment came from. Um, the idea that we have to stop fabricating the other thing, the other comment that came up, or the other thought that came up is that there is really no Casper replacement. We're working on Casper replacements, but nothing other than the Roach 2 supports ADD for the broad array of ADD converters that are available. So it's kind of one ADD converter, two your kind. There's a whole array on ZDOC, but ZDOC is going away. Right. Of the uh, regarding the layout... I'll get you, Dan. Um, and, and I'll stop immediately after this. I think, the, I think there's an ambiguity when the ADD converter starts out, up it's into the system. Yep. And I don't think the ADD converter guarantees which core is going to feed the cell with this. Right. And, and, and that's, I don't think the reset is kind of a function of the hardware and something we struggle with as well. And I don't know of a solution. And we'd like to work on In the Casper way, if you find a solution, please see the next one. Yeah, no, it'd, it'd be interesting to talk. I'll say. It's easy, easy solved. So you just have to capture a sample and find out how far off it is and have a multiplexer in the data path yeah. to steer it around so that it gets to the right place. Uh, uh, you mean an FPGA? Yeah, so the FPGA right after. Uh, uh, okay. <coughs> uh, good point. I'll talk to you guys go. later. Okay. Sounds good. Hang on. Dan had a... Well, um, yeah, you're, you're not the only guy that uh, has a lot of Roach tubes out there and is worried about our lessons. And uh, I think you talked to Mo... And he, I think you know probably that he is willing to build a bunch of them. He just doesn't want to keep building them. Right. So I think all of us can get in our orders now if you need some to have on the shelf or spares or build out. But you, but don't think that you can order them a year from now. No, no. And that's, I mean, I, I, that's, I agree. I talked to Mo about this. The problem is whether Mo is going to say to us, hey, I need the money now for this. Right. Or guess, so we would then go to NASA and say, guess what? I need the money now, and they're going to say, like, well, take that out of your funding. So if it could be staggered, that's great. But if we can't, then it turns into a different. So the other, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, I think Jonathan suggests you could build your own. The I don't want to do that. The problem is that there are a lot of parts that you can't get. But right. Mo has stashed a lot of them away. He knows about these obsolete parts, and he's got he's been hoarding a box them. of them. So if, you, if people are interested in building boards, I think we could ask Mo to give us some parts for those. Um, and then uh, I just talked to Lin Shu because I was thinking Snap might be an interesting replacement. And they have a nice price list and ADCs that match what you're doing. And the Casper tools are working on the board. And it might be a good match if you do want to migrate. Well, I think, well, depending on what happens with Mo, we're going to have to migrate anyway. So there have been something looking at what we're calling the next generation back ends and whether it's going to be a GPU based, whether we stay with the existing Casper FPGA based because, I mean, we all do research here. That's part of the thing. The problem is we're also trying to do operations somewhat and that comes into a little more of a problem. So, so actually this is a very interesting uh, discussion but we should uh, continue next.
Next lecture. Thank you, Liv. You can ask me later. You can ask me later.